I just have one question. It's based on a conversation that I heard uh, in Hyderabad when I went for a conference. And uh, there were some entrepreneurs that were very reluctant, like you said, you're reluctant to seek funding, right? Um, they were very reluctant because they were afraid of the kind of control that the investor would have in the company. So you mentioned stakeholding and, uh, and this particular entrepreneur said, but what if they take over my vision? In, in your filtering process, in your selection process, identify the right investor whom you would personally want to work with. So, I mean, some of the companies that I'm uh, helping raise capital, so we discuss with them, you know, out of a list of, say, around 100 investors, which are, say, 30 to 40 investors that we should be targeting uh, for, for this particular fundraise. Um, not only from the point of view of whether they'll be able to put in the money that is required, but also, you know, their uh, style of functioning. So, uh, I mean, we go in with an expectation that, yes, I mean, if you're looking to raise, say, 25 crore rupees, uh, obviously that's serious money. And um, the investor will want, uh, say, one both seats. Some cases they might want two both seats. Uh, but typically, you know, someone coming in with, uh, uh, say, a significant minority stake in, into the company, like around one third of the company, so they would obviously, uh, you know, try to put their foot down on certain aspects where, um, you know, the, the company is not managing it the way they would expect. So I think it differs across a spectrum of investors. There would be, uh, I mean, without naming, there are very, very large uh, multilateral uh, institutions, you know, um, uh, government funded bodies that uh, are open to putting in a lot of money but they will not proactively manage the investment so for them it's a financial you know investment so they will come for a board meeting if they are you know based in the us us or europe um, or they might even be headquartered in bombay delhi for an india operations they'll make sure they'll come for a board meeting and you know listen to your presentations if they're happy with it fine if they're not uh, they will offer you know certain comments there that you can work upon but there are many other investors you know, who would uh, look at staying engaged with the entrepreneur on a weekly basis, uh, you know, have those regular calls, uh, assess where things can be better, assess you know, where the strategy can be shaped. So uh, a lot of that depends on you know, the kind of investor that you choose based on your selection process. So I think it is, to answer your question briefly, it is, uh, I think, an expectation uh, that uh, any investor will have coming in on board to uh, uh, influence the company in whatever way they can. Um, and that is uh, probably going to be a given uh, with most of the investors uh, today operating in India. You said generally the typical time for you know funding is about three to four months or five to six months or generally nine months in case of a larger fund. Uh, <laughs> but the time you realize that you, you need funding and you know you start approaching, it's a little difficult. So it does it mean that you know as you start putting in your funds and you start, you start also looking out for venture capitalists to uh, help you in your uh, prospects because you know by the time you realize that you are running out of funds and you you have some bigger plans uh, it gets always a clash so what's your what is the best time to start before you approach an investor it's always good to show something that you've achieved right they always say that they are uh, angel investors who get excited by an idea who will just fund you at the idea stage but typically you end up losing a lot of stake there as well and the, the percentage of entrepreneurs who manage to raise money like that is actually very, very small, right? So, um, you know, without knowing what, what sector you operate in, what one would suggest is that uh, when you start with a little capital, focus all of that in trying to get something on the ground, right? In as little, so um, I think Vikram had that in one of his slides. You could either deploy that money across five different areas, achieving 10% um, 10% progress in those five areas, or you could say, okay, let me focus all of that in one little village, one little city, and show what uh, uh, a much larger version is going to look like, right? So let's say you have 50 lakhs. That 50 lakhs is going to be channeled only in doing that. So the point is, if you have whatever little capital you have, use it very efficiently to show the maximum possible proof of concept, if you are at a very early stage, of course, right? Yes, I agree. It's a uh, tricky, um, you know, uh, situation that many entrepreneurs find themselves in. In terms of, given the time that it's going to take, you know, to raise funds, and uh, you know, I've put in so much money, I'm burning, you know, on a monthly basis. So, how uh, do I balance, you know, the the approaching the investor angle versus the scaling the business uh, aspect? So, one aspect that you could consider is, uh, I mean, there are options for bridge funding. So before 
you know your business reaches a certain point uh, you know that will uh, have interest with uh, serious investors you could also look at you know different bridge funding avenues depending on how your business uh, uh, what what kind of business and the funding need etc uh, there are different uh, options so but again it's not going to be easy banks will offer uh, uh, you know debt funding or working capital based on uh, certain parameters like i mean if you have fixed assets in your business that can be pledged if you have you know uh, personal guarantees or corporate guarantees that can be offered so it is a possibility though it is quite uh, difficult for a early stage company to approach that kind of a uh, uh, facility there are also i mean uh, um, avishkar has a sister concern called intelli grow uh, which also offers you know debt for one to the extent of about 1 crore rupees uh one crore uh, uh, which is unsecured typically unsecured and it is at a high interest rate more than 15% uh, per annum so where banks will not offer funding those are you know options that are available so similarly there are others like first check my first check there are different initiatives across uh, you know uh, that are kind of shaping up in india it's still uh, evolving but uh, as an entrepreneur you know who is who is uh, required to plan up front i think um, it's it's always better to um, you know address what are the available sources right now so friends and relatives are always you know sources to be trusted uh, so close friends who have deep pockets uh, who are you know convinced about your business so that's the kind of challenge that, channel that you should tap into first before approaching an investor uh, so so that you have that money for your business to scale to a point you know where uh, money can come in from an investor to add one point to that um, it's not safe to start with the assumption that you're going to need money in 6 months very difficult it's it's uh, no angels are there seed funds are there but for somebody to uh, fund an entrepreneur without having uh, seen a pilot without having seen on stage it has to be a very compelling uh, concept or idea or the entrepreneur's background fine if nothing is there on ground then the entrepreneur's background the, the relevance to what he or she intends to do has to be there um like vikram was saying right this is pecking order um, friends and family debt if you can afford to service the debt otherwise they come and sit in your head and take away your peace of mind last comes vcs last comes vcs one because they're very difficult to get and two they become a pain anyway once they come so it's it's you know you don't want them sitting on your head 6 months into the game unless there's a good reason why you want to you know Um, avail of that. So my business is running a pilot right now and beginning to put together a financial model. Um but I'm sure this happens with every business but how do I I, mean, I don't really know where we're going to be 5 years down the line. I mean it's projection. But um how could I get some better ideas of what is kind of within range for a reasonable projection of where we're going to be in 5 years? You know, what's too high and what's too low, you know. Um it is um in the waste management business so we're trying to connect households that want to recycle to the informal sector workers um so kind of trying to align environmental interests for recycling um with the um social interests of bettering livelihoods within the sector this is a very uh, essential um you know uh, sector sectoral focus that is required i mean given the scale of uh, problems that uh, you know urban india faces and it's the case in different parts of the world uh, to be honest i haven't looked closely at uh, this particular sector wealth ma- uh, waste management but i have interacted with a few entrepreneurs in the past and um, what i have understood is uh, i mean is this linked to municipalities getting their approvals and you know making sure you reach neighborhoods um, and convince them to trying to avoid municipalities yeah, yeah. okay <laughs> i think at some some point you will run into them uh, it's unavoidable so uh one of the sure one of the you know obstacles that we saw is you know how is this going to scale beyond a couple of neighborhoods where this has been functioning so um i mean to be candid we didn't see the kind of um uh, execution potential in the business that i you know personally looked at uh, mm-hmm. uh, given given you know the uh, the the constraining factors given that you will have to you know get the municipalities in your favor given that a lot of uh, neighborhoods a lot of the consumers actually need that education to do the waste segregation the way it is required i mean and there's been a lot of impetus focus in bangalore of late uh, over the last 3 uh, 4 months or so 
So it's it steps in the right direction, but from the business point of view, the way, I mean, the way typically we look at scale is at least you should try to double your revenues year on year. So is that possible? I mean, if yours is going to be a subscription-based model where you, you know, you basically charge users saying, I mean, there's going to be a collection van going from neighborhood to neighborhood. So everyone who's going to be, you know, uh, using this service is going to pay, say, 100 rupees a month or so. You've got to try to demonstrate that, yes, uh, I mean, the way you are reaching out to customers, um, uh, they are also going to pay for these services because, I mean, one of the points that uh, Snikta mentioned is, I mean, yes, if, if you've got a large enough customer base, but how, out of that, how many are going to actually pay on a consistent basis? So those are aspects, I think, of your business that you need to uh, try to iron out up front. But typically, I mean, as an investor, um, one would like to see at least, you know, if there's a potential of doubling revenues year on year, how quickly do you get to profitability? Um, in, in waste management, I, at least the you know, model that I saw, the returns weren't that great. Um, so, you know, can you, can you look at a 10% margin in the business based on how you're ex executing? So are there cost efficiencies that you can bring in? So I think that's the way you should probably structure. I know it's going to be a little difficult to you know, project a five-way model uh, at a pilot stage, but I think you should take it step by step. So if you're you know, starting with Bangalore as the you know, focus city, then within Bangalore, you know, uh, year one, you're going to be in, say, Indra Nagar, in, in, in year two, you're going to be in Malayshwaram and Palace Gardens, etc. So I think you've got to, I mean, that's, that's the only answer that I have. Uh, I might have to, you know, look at uh, your business a little closely, understand it better to be in a better position to advise, you know, what sort of growth might be possible. But from an investor perspective, just try to, you know, look at the uh, cost being streamlined and to get the profitability quickly. The consumer understanding is very critical. So try to, uh, you know, have a model where you can demonstrate that the customers are going to be paying for your services uh, and the municipality. You've got to, you know, find out how you get these uh, wards or neighborhoods allotted to you, because I think there are a few other people who are interested in this space, and how it's been managed so far has been completely inefficient. So there's definitely room for uh, players like you coming in. Do you have something to say? Yeah, uh, maybe not something very specific uh, to your case, but in general, the, the way you would, uh, from your own perspective, if you forget about the VCs, how do you want to look at where you can get three years down the line, five years down the line? You look at how big your market is, right? Well, that's the first number you start with. Then you say, practically, what can you take? So what are your constraints in, um, let's say your market is 100 units, whatever those units are, 100 customers or whatever. How do you get to that 100? What are the constraints that will stop you from getting to that 100? One is your own time. One is your own, the promoter's ability to you know, um, um, impact all the 100 in the next one month, right? Um, the other is capital. Uh, it is possible to get to that 100 maybe if you raise 100 crores, but nobody raises 100 crores in one year, right? So how much can you realistically raise given that, I don't know your size right now, but let's say you're one crore right now. How much can you realistically raise? So let's say you arrive at that number of 20 crores, 5 crores, whatever is it. So with 5 crores, where can I get, right? The next is the, uh, the, the amount of effort required to break into that customer segment, right? Um, getting into that customer's mind. It cannot happen overnight, right? How much time will it take to go from 100 customers to 200 customers? 100 to 200 will be um, uh, one challenge. 200 to 1,000 is a different challenge altogether, right? So you start with how big is my, is my market, and then you come down to, you know, why can't I reach the market in one year? What, what are all the things, what are all the steps that I will have to cross to get there? So you'll know. Okay, if I'm here today with my resources, that I have today and the resources that I can raise or borrow or hire, this is where I can get next year. That becomes a realistic plan from your side, independent of uh, what looks good on paper or right, what you ideally want it to be. Always what you want it to be <laughs> you know, ends up um, being something very ambitious. Not to discourage you, but right, it, it always ends up being that way. So this is the way I would think about how to build my model. Most people would have technology risks sorted out. They will do the innovation and most of the issues are in delivery and scaling up. And scalability is a big issue because a lot of the entrepreneurial services also depend on government. It, there are a lot of public sector issues. And those are very contextual. What works in Karnataka will not work in Chhattisgarh. Scaling that up is a very different issue. 
Apart from giving money, which al always is important, far more crucial to make it succeed is helping it scale up. What I thought of covering today was how to get the money in, because when you don't have the money, that's the only thing you're thinking about. Um, true. So they are, and as, it, as Vikram mentioned, there are two kinds of organizations. One who don't really bother, right? They put the money in and they'll sort of, uh, you know, maybe attend board meetings and not beyond that. There are some who are really involved in the operations. There are two, these two kinds. And the second kind, um, I can speak for Avishkar. We prefer to get involved in the operations, especially if the company is very early and what sort of, um, if that can be called support, we see it as support. Uh, what sort of support is that? It is uh, making connections, right? Whether in government or outside of government, anywhere, right? Making connections. Sometimes it could be through for a specific deal. Sometimes it could be by getting a board member in, right? You, you can get very influential, very useful, independent board members in using your connections, right? Uh, I think that was the point you were mentioning, where a lot of these companies need to grow with the help of external agencies. Yes, VCs definitely uh, try to do that to whatever extent is possible in, across all of their companies, all the VCs that I know. Beyond that, internally within the organization also, they try to help um, in recruiting key talent, right? Senior talent, CEO, sometimes the CEO as well, you know, as, as you would know, promoters not always good to be a CEO, CFO, key talent. Uh, recruitment is something that uh, a lot of VCs want to help with and, you know, end up doing some value add in. Strategic thinking is uh, one that uh, all the board members definitely help with. If you come one level lower, and this is something where it, it depends on the stage of the company and the requirement of the company. Operational value add, sometimes a promoter is, you know the promoter doesn't want it. It doesn't want to see your guys on a daily basis, so you won't do it. But companies that are either struggling, companies that are in markets that are changing very rapidly where, you know, you can just go fall on either side of the wall in one day. There you even provide operational value add, where you're brainstorming with the promoter on, is this the right partner to go with? Is this the right uh, marketing approach to take? Should I increase my spend on marketing? Or um, am I compliant if, it's, if I'm a hospital, right? Uh, what sort of risks am I looking at when I'm treating patients? Do I, should I have uh, an ethics compliance committee? All these operational level um, topics also are something that a VC would get involved if there is a requirement if it is the kind of VC who believes they should help. Of course, there are a lot of VCs who do not believe in doing that, especially the later stage ones. They're the companies that are on autopilot. So this is typically the sort of support that is provided. I'm sorry. Um, another very important support is further fundraising. That becomes very useful. A VC, it's, it's, um, it's sort of an incestuous community, right? Everybody knows everybody else. Everybody feeds on somebody else's thinking. So it's very useful. Uh, having, so getting the first investor is very difficult. Second investor is slightly easy because you, one, you've proven your model. Two, the guy is helping you go to other suitors. Uh, I think uh, she covered uh, most of uh, you know, the aspects where uh, an investor would add value. Um, so um, if, you, if you identify the right investor up front, so you should expect all of these aspects, you know, um, follow-on funding, also introduction to uh, other investors um, for uh, round two, round B, you know, series C rounds. Um, also, um, you know, a more hands-on investor would provide the right connections for uh, plugging in the gaps in your business, whether it's HR or, uh, you know, strategic implementation, execution issues. Um, but I think, I mean, um, it, 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 it goes to a certain extent. I mean, uh, there will be friction between what the investor uh, brings in, what the investor wants to implement, and, um, you know, what the entrepreneur is willing to accept. So, um, and also, uh, I mean, at, at some point, uh, the investor's, um, you know, limitations might be exposed. Um, so you've got to... You've got to work around it. You've got to realize, I mean, most of the investors that you would be dealing with be financial investors. So there are financial investors, there are strategic investors. Strategic investors is, I mean, if you are a healthcare company, you approach Dabur, you know, and they come in, put in money. They um, also bring the Dabur way of working in, and influence, you know, your, your company might be ABC, and in future, it might be called Dabur ABC. So all the retail outlets and uh, centers that you have would, could be completely rebranded. So, uh, I mean, one way, I mean, you as an entrepreneur, uh, entrepreneur may not like it, but from, from the other uh, perspective, uh, it, 
increases tremendous visibility and you know the dabur uh, marketing strength etc would come in i'm just giving an example there i mean that's possible from if you approach a right strategic investor it seems like a lot of social enterprises place a lot of uh, emphasis and kind of struggle a lot with impact assessment um, is do you guys uh, or do do impact investors look for some like quantifiable metric for impact and then the second part of that is it either way um, is there a circumstance where an impact investor would be willing to accept lower rates of return for higher uh, potential impact? On measuring uh, impact, I think yes, there is a certain amount of subjectivity. Um, what can be quantifiable in terms of number of people who are, you know, uh, availing your product or service is uh, something you know that is based on data, historical data. That is something that can be easily quantifiable. So. If uh, you know uh, yours is a company, say it's an ambulance company, and you know that so so and so number of calls happen per day uh, for say 100 ambulances that are operating, then you know that you know out of those uh, number of calls that you serve, how many were from the BOP and how many were you know actually um, in the high income segment, depending on their ability to pay. So those are ways in which you can categorize that. Um, but if you were to try to ascertain the qualitative element. So, uh, you know, for the same example, so out of those number of, uh, you know, cases that were uh, uh, handled by the ambulances, how many were, you know, serious cardiac or emergency related issues and how many were just, you know, hospital to home transfers or hospital to hospital transfers that are not critical. So when you bring in that qualitative element of impact, that is when, you know, it becomes fuzzy. So um, it, it's very difficult to compare one investment versus another um, you know, when you add that uh, qualitative subjective impact. But in terms of um, the general quantifiable metrics and the number of people in the BOP segment who have used my product is something that is uh, measurable. Uh, number of repeat users is something that you can track. Uh, and uh, number of people willing to pay, et cetera, et cetera. So those are, uh, you know, metrics that uh, I think uh, in any social enterprise can track. Uh, the standards in this space are still being defined. Uh, like you have the GIRS, uh, GIRS, uh, then uh, IRIS is another, uh, you know, um, uh, avenue to capture social metrics. Acumen has, uh, you know, has had its BACO and other sort of um, uh, metrics that they uh, try to define for every investment. So I think it's going to differ from investor to investor. But if you are approaching a social uh, or an impact investor, these are some of the basic elements that they would like to see. So out of your product or service, you know, what percentage of the market uh, that you're offering to is in that BOP segment, how many users are there. So there are some of these that can be easily captured. And uh, it's going to vary on a case-to-case -case basis, uh, the level of compl complexities involved. So I'm interested to know how um, likely are investors or to believe an NGO or, or even like a social enterprise's own numbers. And until when are they willing to believe our own numbers? When are they gonna start requiring us to have a third party come and evaluate our social impact? Or, um, you know, because I've actually been, well, I, I, so I am one of these fellows on one of these fellowship programs. These uh, lovely white people here are all on this fellowship program with me. Um, and so I've actually been seeing a number of, I've been doing a lot of research on kind of some of the social impact measurements that a variety of organizations are doing, not only the, the one that I work with, but a number of them. And I've been somewhat disillusioned to see the way that impact assessment is being done um, because the figures, I mean, the, the quotes that are being re reported on websites and things like that are um, quotes that the NGO workers or the social enterprise workers are things that they think they remember someone saying when they were on a field visit, or um, the numbers are all multiples of 10, or, um, you know, we'll go and we'll ask, um, you know, I've heard my friends saying that they, they asked an entrepreneur that they're working with what they think the number of people that they impact are, right? Like, what kind of numbers are that? Like, we're not really verifying that, we're not really checking that, so, I mean, and then we're presenting that on our website or the blog or to the investors, and we're saying we're we're affecting uh, you know three thousand people, and that's getting verified. Like until what stage of you know as a startup, you know as a company of six months, one year, maybe that's fine. Maybe the investors are going to buy that. But at year seven, are the investors going to be like, okay, sure, you're you're helping you know one million people? So you know the reason why all these um, 
um, numbers evaluations happen is, uh, as Vikram mentioned earlier, how do you compare, right? So if I'm, uh, if not, not me, but if my investor is trying to decide where do I put more money, which company do I support, which company do I sell to some other investor, then I want to see who's creating more impact. And unfortunately, there are a lot of qualitative things that cannot be quantified. And then you send an external agency to go. So how, 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 how are qualitative things quantified? A lot of times through surveys, right? And that's when you send an external agency to go do a survey among, you know, in, in your target population, whoever it is you're saying that you're benefiting, right? That is how, that is one way of capturing information. As far as, but otherwise, um, at early stages, even at later stages, especially for social enterprises, the social impact is almost always proportional to your revenue, right? If it's, if your company is growing, it means the, uh, if you're selling to the poor, let's say, it means the number of people that are buying your products are increasing or the number of products a person, a poor person is buying is increasing. Therefore, the convenience is increasing, right? Or if it is rural employment that you're generating, company is growing means you're employing, uh, you know, more, um, you know, uh, rural guys. So that becomes very evident. So it's not about um, trust or anything. It's just about how do you capture the qualitative data and, that is done through external agencies, either because an investor wants is sending an external agency, or because you yourself want to um, be able to compare. And uh, you know, I, as far as I know, nobody is very convinced about any impact measurement techniques that they're using right now. There is this um, uh, 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 example that everyone gives. If you take the big builders out here, you know, building huge buildings in. Uh, Delhi and Gurgaon, they have, they employ thousands of uh, people, right? All the masons, the construction workers, there's thousands and thousands of them. So anybody working in one village and employing, let's say, 100 farmers in a plantation can never compete with them if you're just talking about number of employees. But the builder is not even looking at impact. They don't care about impact. All they care about is buildings. So what you say is unfortunately true. So if I just because I'm saying I'm employing thousand people doesn't mean I'm a great, uh, I'm I'm, I'm you know, doing great impact, but people are still struggling to try and define, therefore, what it is that I should run after. Is it just numbers? Is it a combination? What combination? I think, I mean, what you mentioned is right. I mean, there is a, um, that, that multiplier effect that kicks in, right? So a household impact is like five people. Uh, so you multiply that by five straight away. Um, and uh, yes, I mean, there is a tendency to exa exaggerate social impact by many uh, enterprises. but. Also, I mean, bear in mind that there is real impact happening. So how that is being, um, as I mentioned, I mean, there are many metrics that are, um, that can be quantified without, uh, you know, with, with, with very little subjectivity. But then, I mean, in the overall process of capturing impact, you know, uh, so I mean, someone buying, uh, you know, groceries at a rural Kirana is obviously very, very little impact. I mean, uh, it's, it's like, last mile rural supply chain and all that, I mean, but something that has already been happening and it doesn't require a social enterprise to do, go and do that and create, you know, uh, much more meaning, meaningful impact as opposed to, you know, microfinance, microcredit or affordable healthcare. When we at United Capital, you know, look at uh, social enterprises looking to raise funds, so we try to make sure it is captured in a, in a manner that is appropriate and accurate to the extent possible. So obviously, I mean, it has to appeal and at the same time have that uh, element of, uh, uh, accuracy where uh, to the extent it uh, is possible.